Hi friends, how are you doing today? I'm Ninja Whale. Welcome to another episode of Today in Chinese History. Actually, today I got a little bit derailed, so technically it won't be Today in Chinese History, but you'll see what happens. Before I start, I just wanted to give a heads up. I'm probably going to go back to like lower uploading frequencies because my day job has been picking up, so I thought I should focus a little bit more on that. But I do have a couple of extra Chinese videos. Um, if anybody is interested, I can post those on YouTube as well. So I'm going to stop blabbing and let's just travel back in time. So again, we're going to start with our time machine, um, Electronic Resources for Chinese Studies, and we're going to go to newspapers once again. Um, so today is going to be another episode of Qing Dynasty history, probably. I will try to do other dynasties in upcoming episodes once I find like a better time machine that allows me to travel back further. Okay, so today let's choose a different newspaper database. Last time we did this uh, like late Qing dynasty, like major newspapers. So today, what about let's try tabloid newspapers. Okay, so there is a selection here. I'm actually a little bit interested in what they mean by foreign newspapers. Ah, interesting. Okay, the place of publication, I'm looking at the place of publication for all of these little tabloid newspapers are Shanghai. I don't know too much about foreign settlement in Shanghai, but I, I presume that there's a decent amount of foreigners because otherwise there wouldn't be that many tabloid newspapers that are in English language, right? Inaugural issue time. Oh, wow. So this one started in 1850. That's probably the most far back for any newspaper that I've stumbled upon so far. So let's check that out. The North China Herald. Actually, if the inaugural issue of this newspaper is 1850, then that's actually before the destruction of Yuan Mingyuan in the Second Opium War. And if I'm correct, that happened in October 1860. So I know that this series is supposed to be like today in Chinese history, but I want to cheat a little bit because this, this is a little bit too interesting. So how about we go for October 1860 to see if there's any report of the destruction of Yuan Mingyuan in this newspaper? Okay, so just a refresher to help us pick the date for the newspaper we want to look at. Um, on October 18th, 1860, Lord Elgin, the British High Commissioner to China, retaliated against the Chinese resistance by ordering the destruction of the Old Summer Palace. So we want something in late October. So let's go back to the newspaper archives. We are on 1860 October. There's one October 20th and one October 27th. So I'm guessing that it would be in October 27th if the newspaper reported it at all. I'm very curious to see how the destruction of Yuan is covered in uh, a foreign language newspaper that was published in Shanghai. Out of curiosity, I kind of like Googled the history of foreigners in Shanghai. So what I found was this term called Shanghai Lander. And uh, Wikipedia says that Shanghai Landers were foreign, principally European and American settlers in the extraterritorial areas of Shanghai between the 1842 Treaty of Nanjing and the mid 20th century. Yeah, so the Treaty of Nanjing, here's the Wikipedia page on that, was the peace treaty that ended the first Opium War, which was signed in 1842. So here's where I derailed from Wikipedia, and I instead looked at um, a PDF that I have of a book written by Professor Jonathan Spence called The Search for Modern China. And I know that he has a chapter on the Opium War. I find that I trust his opinion much more than Wikipedia. So here, he talks about the Treaty of Nanjing, which again was signed in 1842. All right. The treaty contained 12 main articles that cumulatively had significant ramifications for China's ideas of commerce and society. Peace and friendship is article one. So article two is the opening of five Chinese cities. And I guess here's the map here. Uh, Guangzhou, Fuzhou, Xiamen, Ningbo, Shanghai. To residents by British subjects and their families for the purpose of carrying on their mercantile pursuits without molestation or restraint. Article 3, the island of Hong Kong to be possessed in perpetuity by Victoria and her successors and ruled as they shall see fit. Article 4, payment of 6 million by the Qing as the value of the opium which was delivered up in Canton. Whoever wrote this treaty just sounds like a big fat bully. Article 5, abolition of the Canton co-home monopoly system and permission at the five above named ports for British merchants to carry on their mercantile transactions with whatever persons they please. 3 million in settlement. Article 6, more payment. Article 7, more payment. 
Article 8, immediate release of any prisoners who are British subjects. Okay, so yeah, that sounds like a pretty unfair um, treaty. I guess we can read all of it. But I guess the relationship between this treaty and the term Shanghai landers uh, is more so to do with Article 2, where um, because of the opening up of these five cities, you got a lot of British settlement in Shanghai. Now, so they open up five cities, right? But remember that here, when we were looking at new foreign newspapers published in China, we saw that the place of publication of like all the foreign language tabloids that they have here were Shanghai. So were there like, were there just more people who settled in Shanghai compared to the other four cities? Or, or um, yeah, so that's something that I'm curious about and probably don't have time to, for, for in this video, but that'll be something interesting to look up. Okay, so now that we kind of have an idea of the readership of this newspaper, let's go back to this October 27th, 1860 newspaper called the North China Herald, uh, published in Shanghai. So there does seem to be an article on, on Yuan Mingyuan. Should I just read it? It might be a little bit boring, but I think this is something that's very valuable for us to read how the destruction of Yuan Mingyuan was covered, like literally a week after it was destroyed. There's a rumor that the preliminaries of a peace have been signed at Peking. The last authentic intelligence that came down was not of such a favorable description as to lead English residents in China to believe that the Earl of Elgin would entertain any advances from the imperialists until he had taken ample revenge for the murder of the two unfortunate captives who are known to have perished from the horrible treatment received at the hands of their inhuman jailer. I guess that thinking back to the Wikipedia page, the the two captives are like part of the British envoy and the so-called uh, inhuman jailers are the Chinese. Our ideas as Christian individuals properly lead us to look on the forgiveness of personal, personal injuries as a meritorious moral act, but the doctrine does not extend itself to nations and national justice. A powerful empire like England is bound to resent and punish acts of gross barbarity and treachery, such as the Chinese appear to delight in. To forgive or pass over such acts with indifference is simply to encourage their recurrence, and we shall certainly lose more national prestige in this curious land by entertaining negotiations for peace, while the murder of Anderson and De Norman is yet filling with grief the hearts of all who knew them, then we shall gain by the whole campaign. Okay, so I won't claim to be an expert on the Opium War, but um, pretty sure the British killed a lot of Chinese too. I guess those lives don't matter to them. We have but too many dismal tales of the treachery of the Chinese and the way they love to deal with such foreigners as fall into their hands. And we are not without a record of English indifference when such acts have been perpetrated. It is not very long ago that seven Englishmen made an excursion to a village close to Guangzhou for the purpose of sport. The villagers rose and killed them. A little negotiation with the Canton authorities terminated the affair. None of the culprits as far as as far as we can learn, were ever brought to justice. We have heard that about a year afterwards, a gunboat of Her Majesty did visit the village with destruction, but it was for another offense. The moral of the first, that Englishmen could be murdered almost with impunity, spread itself afar, and who knows but that the recollection of the unrevenged fate of these seven gentlemen had a great deal to do in inspiring the seizure of the foreigners who were kidnapped at Wampoa and elsewhere during the Canton difficulty. An official account of the captivity of some of the prisoners now dead or released will probably soon be made public. Until then, we must satisfy ourselves with the reports that have reached us. These from first to last are so bad, and with regards to Anderson and Norman so heartrending, that we are sure some signal vengeance will be taken on a treacherous foe by our victorious generals. The Chinese officials will no doubt make the usual assertions that everything was done without their knowledge and will readily produce jailers or some other unfortunates to be sacrificed to the ire of the allies. But that is not what we want. We must make the officials feel, not the underlings and people. Yeah, because you are already making the underlings and people feel. Such measures as the looting of Yuan Mingyuan are the only efficacious ones with obstinate mandarins. What a great justification of looting. When they clearly see that the punishment falls on them and not on usual victims, the common people, they will begin to have some respect for us, but certainly not before. 
Again, the position of the Allied army is such just now that peace without any further measures would be the worst possible event for foreigners. We know that England has a happy knack of losing half the advantages gained by a series of victories by a single treaty. It would be impossible to refer to history for a single instance of a treaty in which Great Britain has not suffered from the timidity and short-sightedness of her governors. Wait, we totally read articles from the 1842 treaty. Only like big fat bullies would call that timid, no? Okay, let's keep going. Let us hope this will not be the case now. We are actually in possession of the defenses of Peking, and the city is literally at our mercy. The impregnability of the great mysterious capital of which Chinamen make so much has been proved to be all nonsense. Okay, um, I'm not backed up by anything, but Chinamen just sounded pretty derogatory to me. An imperial palace has been looted, and even the most expectant of foreigners has been astonished at the amount and worth of the plunder therein round. We have made the emperor beat a somewhat hasty retreat and have seen his vaunted army vanish before us. And yet, instead of pursuing our successes and at once taking possession of the treasury, wherein, wherein is an immense amount of hard, tangible gold and silver, and of the imperial palaces in Peking, reports us that the plenipotentiaries and commanders-in-chief have stopped all operations, sat down on the city wall, and begged of somebody to come and make peace with them. Such a policy is too suicidal to be true. We shall be forever twitted with our cowardice if we don't enter this Peking. The Chinese will never cease to tell us we dare not and that the Tartars allowed us to go so far because they knew we should give in before the capital, the impregnability of which will be more renowned than ever. Why should we stop at the Northwest Gate and not enter the city as conquerors? Great imperialist thinking. Does anybody suppose that Chinese authorities will be less anxious to treat when we have served imperial property inside the walls as we have served it outside? Why the capture of Yuan Mingyuan had a greater effect on the Chinese than the capture of Taku Tianxing and Tang Chao? Ai, and all the intermediate defeats sustained by the Tartars. If we are warring against the emperor, the only way to make him at all sensible of our power is to take his very dwelling places. If we fall back on Tian, I think this is Tianjin, without entering the capital, we have lost all that has been gained, and any hastily made treaty, such as report says has been made, will merely put matters off for a year or two, and England will then have to do the whole over again. Wow. That is a very interesting view on the destruction of Yuan Mingyuan. Um, yeah, I'm curious what Jonathan Spence's account of, of the destruction of Yuan Mingyuan is. I have a feeling it's going to be different. So before I read Dr. Jonathan Spence's account, I just want to put it on the record that I'm not saying which account is more accurate. Um, that's not the point. I think my point is more that it's important for us to read different sources on the same event because each of those sources will carry their own bias. Um, I hesitated from presenting a Chinese account because that would be more easily discredited by people saying, oh, well, Chinese accounts are biased. Um, so I chose to present as a second perspective an account by an American historian, Dr. Jonathan Spence. So here we go. So recall that the destruction of Yuan Mingyuan is in 1860, right? Okay, so this Treaty of Tianjin of 1858 imposed extraordinarily strict terms on China. A British ambassador was henceforth to reside in Peking, accompanied by family and staff and housed in a fitting residence. The open preaching of Christianity was protected. Travel anywhere inside China was permitted to those with valid passports and within 30 miles of treaty ports without passports. Once the rebellions currently raging in China were suppressed, trade was to be allowed up in the Yangtze as far as Hankou, and four new Yangtze treaty ports, Hankou, Zhoujiang, Nanjing, and Zhenjiang, would be opened. An additional six treaty ports were to be opened immediately, one in Manchuria, one in Shandong, two in Taiwan, one in Guangdong, and one on Hainan Island. The Tianjin Treaty also stipulated that all further interior transit taxes on foreign imports be dropped upon payment of a flat fee of 2.5%. Standard weights and measures would be employed at all ports and custom houses. Official communications were to be in English. The character for barbarian, Yi, must no longer be used in Chinese documents describing the British, and British ships hunting pirates would be free to enter any Chinese port. A supplementary clause accompanying the various commercial agreements stated explicitly, Opium will henceforth pay 30 tails per pickle, approximately 130 pounds, import duty. The importer will sell it only at the port. It will be carried into the interior by Chinese only and only as Chinese property. The foreign trader will not be allowed to accompany it. 
This condition was imposed despite the prohibition in the Chinese Penal Code on the sale and consumption of opium. Virtually the only British concession was to pull back from Tianjin and return the Dagu forts to Qing control. The British evidently expected China's rulers to abandon the struggle at this point, but Qing would not and showed no intention of following the treaty clause that permitted foreign ambassadors to live in Peking. In June 1859, to enforce the new treaty terms, the British once more attacked the Dagu forts, now strengthened and reinforced by Qing troops. Fighting was heavy and the British were beaten back, even though the American naval commodore Josiah Tatnell, despite his country's declared neutrality, came to the aid of wounded British Admiral Hope with the ringing cry, blood is thicker than water. Repulsed from the Dagu forts, the British sent a team of negotiators to Peking by a different route in 1860, but they were arrested by the Qing and some were executed. Determined now to teach the Qing a lesson they could not ignore, Lord Elgin, Britain's chief treaty negotiator, ordered his troops to march on Peking. On October 18, 1860, following Elgin's orders, the British burned to the ground the Yuan Mingyuan, the exquisite summer palace in the Peking suburbs, built for Tianlong's pleasure using the plans of Jesuit architects. The British, however, spared the Forbidden City palaces within Peking, calculating that destruction of those hollowed buildings would be a disgrace so profound that the Qing dynasty would inevitably fall. The emperor had already fled the city from Manchuria and named his younger brother, Prince Gong, to act as negotiator. But there was nothing left to negotiate, and on the very day the summer palace burned, Prince Gong reaffirmed the terms of the 1858 Tianjin Treaty. In an additional convention of Peking, the emperor was stated to express his deep regret at the harassment of the British Queen's representatives. He also promised a further 8 million taels in indemnity, permitted Chinese immigration on British ships, made Tianjin itself a treaty port, and ceded part of the mainland Kowloon Peninsula to Hong Kong. Thus did the treaty system reach its fruition. From this, what I got was uh, the Qing dynasty is portrayed as less weak than it was in the article that we read. The, the, the terms of the treaty less timid than what the article that we read proposed. Another interesting thing that I personally noticed was that in the article that appeared in the North China Herald, uh, they framed the entire burning of Yuan Mingyuan as like vengeance for British lives lost but doesn't really mention opium at all. And I mean, it's called the Opium Wars, right? And to me, the article sounded like a bunch of bullies victimizing themselves. Yeah, I think I'm gonna like refrain from making any more comments. This is only also just one additional perspective. There are so many more perspectives out there that um, I would encourage you to seek out. I hope that the 1860 foreign language newspaper in Shanghai would um, spark some thought. But yeah, like I said, I encourage you to check out different perspectives on the Opium War because there are many. Yeah, so if you like my videos, please hit subscribe. Feel free to check out some of my other videos. And thank you for watching and see you next time.